active um, chat, so you can obviously stay muted, but don't uh, hesitate to unmute yourself if you have a question as things come up. Uh, what I'm going to be going over today is a glimpse of really the, I, I would say, the most meaty changes in the 2024 GAR forms, uh, primarily uh, changes to the FMLA, um, I mean, the uh, FHA and VA um, loan exhibits and uh, changes to the uh, seller and buyer brokerage agreements um, and some new special steps. So obviously we only have an hour, but I just want to um, focus on, you know, some of the stuff that I think is going to affect you guys on your day-to-day -day practice of real estate. Let's see, we've got people steadily logging in, which is awesome. I'd love it if you guys would turn your cameras on so I could see your faces. <laughs> it's not required, but I would just, it would make me happy. I'm just saying. Good morning. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so far we have 12. I'm sure we'll probably have some others that will be joining us, but I'm going to go ahead and start jumping into things. So first up, uh, again, I, as I said, I'm not able to go over every single solitary change in the GAR forms, but um, one thing that I always try to emphasize is the changes that are the most uh, substantive. So you're not going to get a lot of um, uh, updates uh, from me regarding a paragraph that got rearranged, renumbered, or bolded, or the change in one word, or a comma, or punctuation. I'm always looking to update you guys um, with the uh, language that actually changes, you know, what you do and how you practice real estate. So uh, that's always going to be my biggest focus. So uh, what I put together is a very uh, short uh PowerPoint presentation. We'll go over it. And if along the way, anybody has questions, again, this is an open format for you guys. And it's all just uh, like a little uh, casual learning environment. So if uh, anybody has any questions uh, as we go through a slide, I think we only have like nine or 10 slides. Um, so if anybody has a question that pops up as we're starting to discuss this, by all means, do not hesitate. Just go ahead and um, and let me know. Uh, that you that you uh, have a question and just um, chime in. Okay, so I'm going to start first with some changes that I think are probably the biggest changes, I would say, um, as far as affecting the way you practice real estate um, uh, when representing buyers and also when representing sellers. And that is the changes uh, um, made, made to the uh, loan exhibits. Uh, the FHA and the VA loan exhibits. So first up, I'm going to look at the FHA um, uh, loan exhibit. So I apologize because when I'm putting together these um, PowerPoints, I never know how they're going to look on the screen to you guys. But let me just tell you what it says. You'll notice here we have our amendatory clause. For those of you who have been doing this a long time, you know that the FHA amendatory clause in the FHA loan exhibit is an ironclad appraisal contingency. And in that blank that's highlighted in yellow, that's where you put your purchase price. You don't want to mess with that. You want to always uh, put the purchase price that's negotiated on the front of the contract. This is HUD uh, required language. HUD uh, dictates the basic parameters and content of the amendatory clause for the FHA uh, loan exhibit. And that is because HUD is, con in, is in control of FHA. And this language is absolutely required, non-negotiable, to be a part of a purchase and sale agreement if uh, the buyer is obtaining an FHA loan. So this amendatory clause has been around forever since I can possibly remember uh, many decades. But what has been added is paragraph 13. And you'll see paragraph 13 added to the VA exhibit as well. We're going to go over that as well. 
but basically, um, let's just read over and you can tell me what you think. I'm anxious to get your feedback. Um, we've always been told and up until now that no stipulation or agreement can control over the amendatory clause language. Okay, that's something that's even been in the GAR contract of the, under the rules for interpreting, uh, interpreting the contract. Nothing can contradict the FHA or VA amendatory clause language. So uh, you guys tell me whether you think that paragraph 13 contradicts it or not. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, it hasn't been tested yet. But basically the FHA amendatory clause language that's been around for decades says it's expressly agreed that the that notwithstanding any other provision to the contrary, that the buyer will not be obligated to complete the purchase of the property described herein or incur any penalty of forfeiture of earnest money deposit, deposits or otherwise um, unless a uh, buyer has been given in accordance with HUD and FHA requirements a written statement by the Federal Housing Commissioner or a direct endorsement lender, which is what we're normally getting, setting forth the appraised value of the property of not less than blank. Uh, that blank is gonna be the same amount as the purchase price. And basically what that says is, if it doesn't appraise, buyer uh, will suffer no penalty. And basically the buyer has a right to terminate and get out of this contract and get the earnest money back. That's how it's always worked. Now we have paragraph 13. Paragraph 13 is saying, notwithstanding the above, okay? Uh, if a written statement of, by the federal uh, housing commissioner or direct endorsement lender sets forth an appraised value of the property that is less than the minimum appraised value, which is in that blank, buyers shall immediately provide seller with a written copy of such um, appraised value. In other words, a copy of the low appraisal. If it appraises at or above the, the purchase price, the buyer is not obligated to deliver a copy of the, the appraisal only in the event that the appraisal comes in low. And just as a reminder to you guys, with FHA and VA, the appraisal contingency is tied to the uh, closing date. So it doesn't expire early or prior to closing the way that it does for conventional or cash or uh, USDA loans. With FHA and VA, you don't have a deadline for an expiration date in these appraisal contingencies. You do have a, a, a financing contingency uh, deadline in those exhibits, but that's a completely separate type of contingency. The appraisal contingency is its own separate contingency and it doesn't have a deadline because it is alive until time of closing. But what this is saying is if it appraises low, that buyer shall immediately provide seller with a written copy of the appraised value, meaning a copy of the low appraisal. Seller may, but shall not be required to within five days. So there's a window, there's always a, a, a little limit, a window of time for that right to be exercised. Within five days from the date the buyer delivers notice to seller of the appraised value, reduce the price of the property to the appraised value upon notice to the buyer. In the event, in such event, the parties immediately uh, shall immediately prepare and sign an amendment to agreement reflecting the new sales price and deliver signed copy of the same to the other party. Buyer and seller shall then close on the transaction at the amended sales price. All other provisions in this agreement shall remain unchanged. The amendatory clause in section 12 shall remain in full force and effect even if financing contingency has expired. That was always the case. They're two separate contingencies. Okay, so this you will see in the FHA, and let's just go ahead, might as well, and look at it in the VA, same exact thing. In your VA amendatory clause, if we were looking at the VA loan exhibit, our amendatory clause, which is slightly different, but basically has the same uh, requirements, it says it is expressly agreed that notwithstanding any of the provision of this agreement, buyer shall not incur any penalty by forfeiture of earnest money deposits or otherwise be obligated to purchase the property um, described herein if agreement uh, purchase price or cost exceeds a reasonable uh, value of property established by Veterans Administration. 
Buyers shall, however, have the privilege and option of proceeding with the consummation of this agreement without regard to the amount of reasonable value established by the VA. If buyer elects to complete the purchase of property in excess of the reasonable value, aka the appraised value, buyers shall pay such excess amount in cash from the source which buyer agrees to disclose to VA and which buyer represents will not be borrowed uh, funds except for as approved by VA. Even though this says that, and it doesn't specifically say that in the FHA administrative clause, a buyer always has a right to pay the difference. And anytime a buyer is uh, getting borrowed funds for their um, uh, amount that's not financed in by the primary lender, that primary lender has to know that and has to approve of that. In other words, a second mortgage. So um, this language has been, again, around for decades. Again, we have paragraph 13 that is now new and has been added. And again, notwithstanding the above, if the VA um, notice of value is less than the purchase price, buyer shall immediately notify seller um, uh, with a copy of the um, NOV <laughs> notice of value within five days um, from the date uh, the buyer delivers such notice, seller may but shall not be required to reduce the purchase price. Um, to the value stated in the notice of value, aka appraise, uh, appraisal, copy of the low appraisal. Um, in such event, the parties shall immediately prepare an amendment to the agreement reflecting the new sales price and deliver signed copy of the same to the, each other. Buyer and seller shall then close on the transaction at the amended sale, sales price, all of the provisions will remain the same. Um, and again, it's again reminding you guys, because this was always the case, that even if um, uh, your financing contingency in your loan exhibits expires. That is a completely separate contingency and your appraisal contingencies are their own contingencies. And these two, FHA and VA, are live the entire contract. Questions or comments about what you think about this? I have a question about the VA <clears throat> finance the, um, clause. Do they provide the Appraisers? Is that not through the lender then? It's through the it's VA? It's through the lender. Uh, the VA, is. the lender is going to be the one to order the appraisal. It has to be a, a, a VA certified a, a appraiser a certified to do a VA appraisal. But okay. um, the it will be, the, the lender will order that appraisal. Just and like time frames are typically the same? Or I'm time sorry? frames? I said, and time frames? For the appraisal are typically the same, the, or do the they... appraisal time frames? Uh, uh, really, unless they're and I can't answer. That's more of a lender question. More um, lender question. You're right because I don't I don't know the availability if all appraisers are if there if there are um, and I would assume that part of the licensing would be that a, a, a an appraiser in order to get licensed and that's assumption on my part would be certified to do FHA <clears throat> VA and um, and um, conventional, uh, all, and so that the availability of those appraisers to get that done would be the same. But um, again, okay. we've got to be very careful that we are always educating buyers and lenders that the appraisal rights cannot be exercised if we have no appraisal. And that's especially, especially brutal when we're dealing with a conventional appraisal contingency that does have a hard stop and that that's going to expire prior to closing, because once that expires, if we don't have a, a copy of the actual appraisal in hand, we can't exercise any of the buyer's rights. Um, you'll notice here in the amendatory clause in the VA that there's no blank to insert the price. It's referencing the price um, that's agreed to, but you don't have to insert it in the blank. We would love to eliminate that blank in the FHA one, but HUD said no. It's been asked of HUD many times, can we just eliminate that blank um, and just put, like VA does, just reference the purchase price, but uh, so far the response has been no, as, uh, as I understand it. But as far as paragraph 13 contradicting paragraph 12, that uh, is a uh, up for opinion. Um, it hasn't been tested yet. So whether this is going to stick or not, I don't know. Let me show you the next slide. If you look at the body of the purchase and sale agreement, we have a paragraph um, in, I think it's page, um, I think it's page seven of the purchase and sale agreement, six or seven, but it's, it's a paragraph that was added a couple of years ago. Now they've added an additional blank to it. 
And this additional blank basically says, notwithstanding the above, um, the amendatory uh, the amendatory clause in the FHA and the exhibit shall control over any inconsistent provisions. Um, meaning, if we're interpreting the contract, number one, handwritten changes control over preprinted languages. Exhibits control over um, um, the body of the contract. Special steps control over exhibits and the body of the contract. Then, notwithstanding the above, a mandatory clause uh, in FHA and VA exhibits control over all of those things. Then, down here in paragraph five, we said, okay, uh, mandatory clauses in FHA and VA control over all of those things, every bit of the language in the contract, except the further agreement pertaining to a mandatory clause section, which GAR, the GAR Forms Committee, is saying here in paragraph five does not conflict with the um, uh, amendatory clauses. So GAR is trying to use this interpretation paragraph to make a statement and have buyer and seller agree to that, that this new language requiring the buyer to submit the low appraisal um, and, um, and forcing the buyer to agree to standard contract if the seller's willing to amend the price and lower it rather than just having a walk, which up until now they had a walk, if they didn't want to propose an amendment, if they didn't want to give a copy of the appraisal, they didn't have to. And, and well, I would say that they didn't have to, but no one's going to take your word for it. So if uh, you were trying to exercise your right and say, I'm walking because it didn't appraise, then you really need to provide that proof, even though it didn't specifically say that in the contract. Now it says that in the contract, if it appraises low, buyer must deliver a copy of the low appraisal and they don't have a walk if the seller proposes an amendment and says, I'm willing to reduce it. This is a big deal for your buyers because up until this language was added this year, buyers were not obligated to agree with the seller to reduce the price. And that gave them uh, an out. Now they do not have an out. In essence, this is kind of forcing the buyers to give the sellers a cure opportunity similar to what goes on in the conventional appraisal contingency. Where the buyer doesn't have a walk at all, they have to follow the steps of submitting the amendment to reduce sales price. And then along with the uh, low appraisal, and then if the seller refuses, to agree, then they would have the right to terminate. This is going to work very similar to that. Who Comment, that up? It just who seems kind of far reaching in the government to require that, don't you think? It's I mean, not the government. It's not the government that is doing this at all. It is the Georgia Association of Realtors GAR Forms Committee that did that did this. Wow. Hmm. And like I said, it hasn't been tested yet. And I've heard opinions on both sides, and I'm just telling you guys, I don't know if it'll stick. Um, we'll have to see how lenders deal with it. We'll have to see how HUD deals with it, and it'll have to be tested to see if it's going to stick, because if the if the Veterans Administration or if HUD feels like it conflicts with their amendatory clause language, GAR will have to remove it from the contract, but this is something I'm not familiar with. There could be another state that's got similar language in it that's forcing uh, buyers to offer the seller a cure opportunity by saying, here's my low appraisal and I can't just terminate if it appraises low and say, bye-bye, I'm out of here. I have to give you a copy of the low appraisal seller. And if you are willing to propose an amendment to reduce the price down to that appraised value, then I'm stuck. And I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, stay under contract and close at the reduced price. It's literally forcing the buyers to offer the sellers a cure opportunity, which is the whole intent and the whole way that your conventional GAR um, appraisal contingency works. This is a this slightly different structure to it and slightly different requirements. And it does, the, the big difference here too, is that it puts a burden on the seller to propose the amendment. No requirement on the buyer to propose the amendment. All the buyer is required to do is deliver a copy of the low appraisal. Then the ball gets put in the seller's court to sub, uh, submit an amendment to reduce the um, 
the sales price or an amendment to agreement with the new sales price within five days if they want to exercise that right. Buyer then is obligated to sign that amendment to reduce the price. And if the buyer doesn't, I think the buyer under the way this is written is in default. I talked to one of the attorneys that participates in the forms committee and, you know, um, that particular attorney was very um, uncertain as to how this is going to be, um, you know, um, received by lenders, by um, by HUD, by VA, or if they'll even pay any attention to it at all. I don't know. We don't know yet. It could end up becoming a thing. It could end up becoming the new thing, and we may see it from now on. I don't, none of that, I, I don't know any of that yet. But it's something that if you're representing a seller, you need to know that the burden is on the seller to uh, um, propose that amendment. If you're representing the buyer, you need to know that they don't get just a walk and that they must deliver a copy of a low FHA or VA appraisal to the seller. And that as soon as they do that, um, the seller has five days to to um, say, yes or no, I'm going to uh, agree to amend. And the burden to propose the amendment is on the seller. Okay, any more questions before we move on? Nope, okay. All right, now, um, yes, I have an affection for highlight pins. I don't deny it. Uh, sticky notes, highlight pins, Sharpie pins, uh, et cetera. So um, <laughs> this is a couple of changes to the GAR uh, uh, exclusive seller brokerage agreement. Now, the non-exclusive language is going to be the same. The only big changes you have in the exclusive and non-exclusives are the exclusivity type language. But your commission paragraphs and all of that is going to be pretty consistent. Um, and just as a little FYI aside, you would use a non-exclusive listing agreement anytime someone wanted you to represent them as a client but did not want the property listed on any MLS because uh, FMLS and Georgia MLS required that an exclusive listing agreement um, uh, uh, be um, exist in order to list the property on FMLS and Georgia MLS. And it's not, not only that, they require that if you have an exclusive uh, seller brokerage agreement, engagement agreement, um, sign that if it's residential, that it must be put into their systems, FMLS and Georgia MLS, if you're a member, uh, with the exception of FMLS and its compulsory counties. So if it's a county way outside um, uh, Metro Atlanta, then you may not be required. And there is a map that shows that on the FMLS website. But uh, this is uh, in response, what we have here highlighted in green, this is in response to the um, lawsuits, the class action lawsuits that we had going on uh, this past uh, year in 2023 and the judgments that came down and this and that. And part of the um, allegations in uh, several of those lawsuits was that the in the class action case with the sellers, the one that had the very large $1.78 billion judgment, which is susceptible to triple damages because it involves um, federal regulations, uh, federal laws being violated. So uh, that is, of course, being appealed. And I don't anticipate that that judgment amount is actually going to ever actually come to fruition. I believe that it's going to end up settling um, because it's going to become this huge nightmare of legal fees for both sides. But nevertheless, um, you know, the big allegations are one of the big allegations or biggest allegations among the sellers that were participating as plaintiffs in that clash action lawsuit uh, stemmed from sellers saying that agents were routinely uh, making them feel they were required uh, to offer a co-op commission. So not only were they uh, required to pay a commission to the listing agent that they were hiring in that listing agreement, but they were also required to uh, pay enough commission so that uh, that gross commission and a portion of it could be shared in order to cover the co-op slash buyer broker commission. 
And the allegation was that they weren't told this was not legally required. They were, uh, the implication was that this was uh, implied to them that it was required. And what's even worse, because it's not required, um, but what's even worse is they the allegation that not only is it required of you, but if you don't offer it, your um, uh, listing is going to be boycotted and um, and not shown by other agents. Oh, and by the way, not only do you need to offer a commission, but you really need to offer a, a co-op commission to the other broker of at least this much in order to track the other brokers. And if you don't, your listing is not going to be shown. So when you say something like that to a seller, not only is none of that legally correct, nor has it ever been, but when you say something like that to a seller, you're saying price fixing. You're saying we as an industry, as realtors, are going to conspire to boycott listings if we don't get a co-op commission offered as a part of a listing. So even though the agents that were doing this were well-intended and not trying to break the law, they didn't really realize the, the greater implications of what they were saying. And for the past 20 years uh, since I've been teaching and I've been licensed for 25, but since I've been really teaching, I've, I've really driven home rule number one. And rule number one is don't take advice from other agents. And what I mean by that is don't just blindly do what other agents do. And this whole conversation around commission negotiations and conversations with sellers when trying to negotiate commissions in our listing agreements and comments like, oh, you have to offer a co-op fee or else, or, or you need to offer at least this much or else, or blah, blah, blah. That really is the worst case of licensees across the board, company to company, state to state, breaking rule number one that I've ever seen. And I think we would all now in retrospect, retrospect agree with that. So one thing that GAR did, it was a last minute change to the GAR forms before they finished up the package uh, for the 2024 changes, but it's a very good change. And if you'll look here, we have our gross commission. So the paragraph's a little bit reformatted. It's still paragraph four. And it's uh, restructured, but uh, for pretty much uh, is going to be filled out the same. Uh, in 4A, you're going to put your gross commission. That's the total that is going to be deducted from the seller's proceeds, the total gross. So that includes any co-op commission if they do agree to offer a co-op commission. It's your total gross. So you have a choice. You could put either um, the blank percent of the sales price, uh, blank dollar amount, or other. And then in B, um, that's where we're going to identify what, if any, amount will be shared. And this obviously has to be agreed to by the seller and advertised the way the seller agrees to it. So you can't um, state something in this agreement and then advertise something different. So it's very, very, very important. If you ever find yourself in an arbitration situation, they will absolutely want to see your listing agreement and they were going to want to make sure that whatever you've advertised better match that listing agreement. So that's very important. But the biggest change here is in B where it says seller directs broker to either pay or not to pay cooperating uh, broker a portion of seller's commission above. This is huge because this is where a seller can't deny that um, that this was clearly an option that was provided to them. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's about as blatant in your face, pay or not pay. And that's what Gar is trying to do here is say, you were clearly given a choice that you either are directing that a portion of the above gross commission will be paid out to a buyer brokerage agreement if one procures a buyer for us or not. You're either agreeing to that or not agreeing to it. That is putting the burden on the seller to say, listen, nobody's forcing you. We're not saying you have to do that. By the same token, 
you guys are your own independent contractors. You're your own business people. And your brokers are just here to hold your license and help facilitate your practice of real estate. But it's up to you as to what you want to negotiate as the gross commission and also what you think is the best um, effective marketing uh, techniques. So you always have the choice as the agent to decide whether that's business you want and whether the seller, just like a seller who's wanting to take your advice on pricing the listing appropriately or not. It, it, when it comes down to the marketing, this is a, uh, um, a discussion that you need to have in, deep, in depth with the seller about the pros and cons of whether or not they offer um, a uh, co-op commission. What I have been saying in class, and I do teach a class that really focuses on this, it's a, kind of a deep dive into all, all things commission and how you earn commission. And one thing I've said is we're going to stop taking our we're going to start taking ourselves out of the conversation and explain to the sellers we're trying to attract buyers. So we're going to stop saying we're trying to attract buyers agents. No, 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 no. It's not about us. We're trying to attract buyers. And basically, when you offer a co-op commission, assuming the buyer has their own buyer representation, which is going to be a vast majority of the time. And we legally cannot interfere with or uh, um, do anything to um, um, disturb or disrupt or um, terminate or breach that buyer broker's agreement that that buyer has with their buyer broker. But buyer has cash to close they have to come up with. And if you are offering a co-op commission, that is going to, in essence, allow the buyer to finance the co-op commission that they that goes to their agent into the sales price. So that will definitely benefit the buyer as far as their cash to close obligation. So that's the way that I've been trying to help us restructure our way of thinking. It isn't required, um, but you as the listing agent may feel that that is a very um wise choice because in essence you're um letting the um the buyer finance the commission that their agent is going to get paid into the purchase price so that that helps with their cash to close obligation okay now a couple of years ago uh the gar forms committee also added language to the purchase and sale in the commit closing cost paragraph that said if the buyer wanted to um, direct a portion of or all of the um, closing cost that the seller has agreed to pay to cover their commission obligations to their buyer broker, that they could do that. So that's that option is also there. Um, but um, what we're basically saying is, you know, sellers, this is not uh, an obligation and there's no minimum amount. Commissions are always negotiable, but it may be something that would be attractive to the buyers you're trying to attract. So then you would have to, in B, state the amount. Now, the amount that goes into B is the amount that is going to be advertised as the co-op commission. Now, in the exceptions paragraph highlighted in green uh, at the bottom of uh, the B box, um, that's going to be where you put any special circumstances. And I would really encourage you to make sure that you are putting those exceptions in public remarks. FMLS and Georgia MLS are now allowing them to go in public remarks, whereas it used to be private remarks. This would be things like, if I show your buyer the property first, if buyer makes first contact with me, if buyer comes to my open house, et cetera, et cetera, then the co-op commission amount will only be 1.5% of the purchase price. That's not required. Um, not everybody it does that as listing agents, but if you do do that, um, you have to make sure that it is really uh, described in paragraph 4B in the exception section, the same as or as close to the same exact language that you're going to put in the public remarks. And now more than ever, we have to be super, super, super transparent about the co-op amounts being offered, if any, and about any changes or exceptions that will vary that co-op amount because buyers now more than ever 
are going to need to know what co-op amount is being offered. They're going to need to know that if they make first contact with the listing broker, that it, there's a, a comment in there that if the buyer is shown the property by the listing uh, broker or whatever, that the amount of the co-op fee will be reduced because this directly affects the buyer's wallet. Their buyer brokerage agreement, whatever they've agreed to pay their um, broker, will be reduced by the amount of the co-op fee. So let's say, for example, that this uh, listing says that there is a 3% of the purchase price co-op fee advertised. Then the exception section says that if the buyer makes first contact with the listing agent or if the listing agent shows the property directly, blah, 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 that the co-op commission will be reduced to 1.5%. Buyers must know that so that when they go and engage in that behavior and make that first contact and request a showing directly with the listing agent, um, that they realize that will affect the amount of co-op uh, commission that their agent is going to get paid, which will have a spinoff effect of causing them to have to pay that out of their pocket. Any questions? I have a question. So is it not proper then to say to your seller, I charge to work with me, I charge a 6% commission and three of that goes to a co the co, you know, broker. Co co you know what I mean? <laughs> can we say that? You you can say you you can uh you've got to be careful not to say I I charge this and it goes to the other broker. That that you've got to be very careful with because that is saying you can say you can negotiate all you want for your commission but when right. you are making them feel that they have to pay the other broker's commission I would soften that language up and say okay. that this is what I recommend because at the end of the day we're trying to attract buyers and let's explain to you why right. you don't have to do that but from a marketing perspective, I know this is going to be an attractive thing to buyers because this affects their cash to close. That was really helpful. Yeah, thank you. So we've just got to, we can say so much, not everything that we used to say, this is required, you have to pay a minimum, blah, 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 because you, you have to be careful with your matter of fact, boom, boom, boom language, um, because that is was part of the the consensus of um the the class action lawsuit with hundreds of thousands of sellers across multiple states acting as plaintiffs and just a little aside for you guys i didn't pull it up because you know we don't have you know a ton of time in this uh in this presentation but just so you know several years ago um uh seth weissman um added language to the brokerage agreements, which still exist to this day. And the language, at which I don't have snipped here, but it's in all of our brokerage agreements that says that our clients, buyers or sellers, agree not to participate in class action lawsuits, okay? And that they agree that if they have any kind of dispute, that they will settle it by arbitration prior to litigation. Now, many of you may know that there is a Georgia lawsuit that has been recently filed, um, a, a spinoff copycat lawsuit, this always happens, um, as a result of that big uh, lawsuit, class action lawsuit judgment that went down a few months ago. There's a local case filed in Georgia and, um, and Weissman, as the attorney for uh, Georgia Association of Realtors, has confronted the attorney and let them know by the way, you do realize that any of those plaintiffs that have signed GAR brokerage agreements have agreed specifically not to participate in class action lawsuits. Oh, and by the way, they've also participated to arbitrate rather than litigate. So um, that lawsuit is at minimum, we anticipate that lawsuit to be amended, if not a summary judgment, but we'll see. But Weissman's all over it, and that language has been in the GAR brokerage agreements for about five years, maybe six years. So it's been in there for a minute. 
Um, so that's helpful. And that's something that you're not going to find in a lot of states. So that's where we have some above and beyond uh, representation. Let me glance before we slip over to the chat. Um, yes, this is being recorded. Um, for those of you who are asking that question, uh, this is going to be recorded and it should be posted. Now, I want to point out to you guys at the um, uh, paragraph four language. And anytime you're looking at a GAR purchase and sale or a GAR agreement, you always have your blanks on the front and the um, the blanks with the title of the paragraph. And then you, when you flip into the interior of the document, you have a corresponding paragraph with the same title and same number. And that's where the more uh, meat potatoes language is that corresponds with the paragraph on the front of the document that has the blanks. That's the same when it comes to the brokerage agreements. So let's look here under the uh, corresponding language in the body of the exclusive seller brokerage agreement. And this is um, um, paragraph uh, 4B regarding the co-op commission and sharing commission. It says, if seller has directed, obviously we have to be careful, can't say it's required. So if seller has directed broker to share commission with cooperating broker as specified in section A above, it shall be shared with cooperating broker, if any, who procures uh, the buyer for the property. So then that's always going to be the million dollar question. If somebody is a parachuting agent um, and did not procure the buyer and is parachuting in and the buyer has hired somebody after the fact, um, this is the type of situation that you end up in arbitration over um, where somebody um has a buyer call them after they found the house, after they went to your open house, after you've shown them the house, maybe once, maybe twice, you've talked to them, maybe you got them pre-qualified, all this other stuff, you asked them a million times, are you being represented? No, 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 no. Then suddenly they decide that they need representation. Money and agency are two different things and they want to hire representation. That buyer broker is very likely going to want and expect to be paid any co-op commission that you've advertised. However, the language has always been, since I can remember for 25 years, that the co-op commission must be earned through procuring cause of sale. There's two ways you earn your commission. You earn it through a contractual agreement with a client that signed on the dotted line saying, if you do this, I pay this. Or you earn it in the form of procuring cause of sale when a co-op is being advertised by the listing broker with seller's consent, of course, and you can prove you procured cause of sale and you identified that property and you did an unbroken chain of events that caused the buyer to want to buy that property. That is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not a slam dunk. And uh, let's be very clear that a buyer hiring a buyer agent um, and having uh, uh, and signing a buyer brokerage agreement that buyer brokerage agreement only obligates the buyer to pay whatever they signed and agreed to pay. In no way does that buyer brokerage agreement establish procuring cause of sale. And in no way does that buyer brokerage agreement obligate the seller to pay what the buyer agreed to pay. So it all boils down to the behavior and whether any procuring cause of sale occurred. And this is what arbitration actions are all about. When I teach your money agency and brokerage agreement, we dive into it. We get into the nitty gritty of uh, uh, exactly what that looks up, looks like, the definitions and examples of how that shells out. And it's, it's kind of an aha type of class. But I wanted to point out to you guys additional language. Um, it says below the highlighted yellow section that says um, that you will share the commission with a uh, buyer broker, if any, procures a buyer for the property, then it goes on to say, uh, if this agreement specifies that no commission is being paid by seller, seller's broker to the cooperating broker, then no such commission obligation shall exist and the cooperating broker commission shall be paid by the buyer based on the buyer brokerage agreement. Seller's broker shall have no obligation to pay cooperating broker who is not a participant um, in any uh, multiple listing service in which property is listed um, a commission unless cooperating broker has negotiated and executed 
with sellers broker a co-op commission agreement. This has been an ongoing issue. So for example, if you're a Metro Atlanta agent and um, you are showing a property in Macon and you're not a member of the Macon MLS or the Savannah MLS or the Athens MLS or the Columbus MLS, and the only place the property is being advertised and the co-op commission, if any, is being advertised is in that local MLS and you, the agent who can practice anywhere in the state of Georgia, is not a member of that MLS, then what this language is saying is, and this has been an issue, this is nothing new, they're just putting it in writing so that uh, they can offer clarity. Because again, if you go to an arbitration and I've been in plenty of them, they're gonna ask you these questions um, when you go to arbitrate and you say, but I brought the buyer, I brought the buyer, blah, 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 blah. This is one of the issues that's gonna come up. And what they're saying is this form right here, which is uh, the F-258, it's been around for about three years now. Before you show that property, um, at any time that you are uncertain, uh, this is specifically designed to be uh, signed off before you actually show the property, if at all possible. That is the intent of it, is to have it done before the property is being shown. This is absolutely not required on every single showing, on every single co-op. Um, but in a case where there's a question about the amount of the co-op or whether you're eligible for the co-op because it's in an MLS where you're not a member, or maybe there's that exceptions paragraph where it says if buyer contacted and maybe all the buyer did was call the listing agent. Maybe they didn't even show it, but they called them or whatever. If there's any kind of question about the co-op amount or whether you're entitled to it, you need to be leading and confronting that issue immediately right out of the gate with that listing broker and trying to get this nailed down in writing. And that's what the uh, GAR, who hears all arbitrations now across the state, if you're having a battle with another broker over um, commission entitlement um, and the amount of co-op or, or procuring cause of sale and that sort of thing, this is gonna become a huge issue. Comments, questions? Um, I have a question, Angie. So let's say I'm working working with someone in the metro area, all in the MLS that I'm working, then they get a wild hair and decide they want to buy something in Athens. So it's do, and, and they have called me and said, we want to look at this house in Athens. They haven't talked to the listing agent. Do, even though we're like, do, do I need to get this done before we even view it? Or is it that, something that, is, that you, could be done after? It, it says in the top where it's highlighted, you need to do it before you show the property. That is what you need to seek to do. Absolutely seek. Okay. And this is signed by agent to agent. So when you're making that showing appointment, and if you're not a member of the Athens uh, Area Association of Realtors, and you're not a member of their MLS, you're not going to, your lockbox key is not going to work unless they, um, most likely they're going to have, because Athens, I used to be a member and Athens issues lockboxes to the agents there. And so your lockbox key won't even work. You'll probably have to show up by appointment only, but you need to get, when you're calling and making that uh, initial contact with that listing agent, you need to leave with the stock. If it's an issue, you need to know that now and you need to then go back to your buyer and say, okay, buyer, again, I'm going to show you whatever you want to, I, I want to show you. And, you know, the buyer has signed, presumably, the buyer has signed a buyer brokerage agreement saying that I'm hiring you and I'm willing to pay you X, Y, Z. But in the event that the seller is not um, willing to pay uh, a co-op commission or you're not eligible for that co-op commission for whatever the reason, you need to then go back to the buyer and say, we're, we're going to go look at it. What have you? Just understand that this is a situation. So that's going to fall back on you. You'll be the one responsible for paying the commission out of pocket. And can I assume, or I shouldn't say assume, is that a discussion I have with the listing agent? Like, do I get what is listed in the MLS? You know, it, am I getting that, let's yes. say that's 3%? Yes, yes. You need to confront that head on with the agent and whatever is being advertised okay. or whatever exceptions they have or whatever, whatever, whatever it is that should you procure this particular buyer for that particular listing and go under contract, 
you guys need to be super clear on the what uh, commission is going to be paid, how it's going to be split. This is Great. way Thank before you. you ever get to the instructions to closing attorney. The instructions to closing attorney are sure. basically yep. not intended really to establish an agreement of commission. It's just notifying the closing attorney what to put on the settlement statement. This is where you're like, let's get an agreement, okay, um, ahead of the game. I would say this is a handy form anytime there's a question. So I would definitely use this without question if I'm showing a property advertised on an MLS that I'm not a member of, where I don't clearly see and print out and save that document um, that co-op fee that's being um, advertised. Very, very important because an agent can go in and edit it and then you have no proof that that co-op fee was a certain amount. But if there's an exception that under these circumstances, this might be reduced, go ahead and use this form for that scenario as well. Because what you're trying to do is let's see if there's going to be a problem, let's go ahead and deal with it right now. Before my buyer falls in love, before I go and do all this work, let's as mature adult professionals, let's confront this co-op commission right now. And then if this is an issue, it's going to definitely affect my buyer's wallet and their cash to close. And I have to go back to them and make sure they understand. Great. Thank you. We're going to be more transparent than we've ever been. I mm -hmm. don't think that is uh, going to diminish our value. I think that increases our value. Okay, we're we're going to explain to people how all this works, and and uh and, and I think that it it to me the the more you have your mind wrapped around it, the more you understand it, the more valuable you are. Let's look at real quick uh just a disclaimer in the buyer brokerage agreement. So the buyer brokerage agreement, the language is basically the same, but it's an acknowledgement here in paragraph four. Uh, it, again, paragraph four says buyer agrees to pay the broker the commission set forth below at closing of the contract. They just need to wire that along with the rest of their cash to close. And there is a section on the instructions to closing attorney that talks about com um, the commission being paid by buyer. You've got your seller commission being paid and your buyer commission being paid. So now more than ever, we got to really familiarize ourselves with the finer points of that instructions to closing attorney. And that's been there. That's not new. Um, but it says that the buyer will pay this amount minus any commission paid to broker by either seller's broker or the seller. So that would be that co-op commission. That co-op commission amount will offset whatever's in this uh, section 4B. So if they're the same amount, it's a complete wash and the buyer owes zero. If the amount of the co-op is higher than the amount in 4B, it's again a wash. Great, good for you. You you earn more money, um, no problem. And a buyer is not obligated to pay a penny out of pocket. It's only if the amount of the co-op is less than the amount that is in paragraph four B in the buyer brokerage that the buyer would owe the difference. Now that difference can be a small amount or it could be the full amount because right here in in green we want to make sure the buyer understands. And it says buyer acknowledges that neither sellers nor sellers brokers are obligated to pay any commission to the to the broker. In other words, to the buyer's broker. Okay, so that is uh, optional. Let's look at a couple new special steps. Um, these are new special steps that again were added. Um, and I want to just caution, caution you, and these are some that I go over in the uh, money agency and brokerage agreement class. This is special step uh, 619 and 620. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with, please, please, please look into this because there's literally hundreds of um, GAR special steps. So uh, go to wherever you find your GAR forms. I know you, a lot of you guys uh, um, use, you know, dot loop and different resources. But um, if you're having trouble finding it, you can always find it on Transaction Desk in FMLS and also Remind in FMLS, which everybody's a member of. So you can go into Remind and you just uh, go into the forms library and do a search of 2024 special stipulations. And you will find a list of hundreds of special steps. And 
there's these two new ones. Now I added um, a, a little bit of language here because um, the the language in the basic special stip that you're going to find just has a blank. And um, that's dangerous, in my opinion, because it doesn't say um, whether it's a percentage or a dollar amount. And it doesn't say, or I think it may just say percentage, but it doesn't say percentage of what. I mean, that can be really bad. If you're going to say it's a percentage of something, you better specify a percentage of what. Is it a percentage of the commission? Because that's a tiny little amount. Or is it a percentage of the purchase price? Because 3% of the gross commission is a tiny little amount. And 3% of the purchase price is a much bigger amount. So I've added that in parentheses just as an educational thing for you guys. In a, a situation where you have a VA buyer and there is no co-op fee um, being offered, okay, and your buyer is getting a VA loan, obviously you attach the VA loan exhibit to the offer, but you can add this special stip. And that is because, you know, VA does not um, allow a buyer currently, that could change, but currently does not allow a buyer to pay their the uh, buyer brokerage commission. So uh, we're gonna add this special stip, and this is only in cases where the buyer um, has agreed to pay a commission, and then the uh, buyer is obligated to pay that commission in the buyer brokerage, and the amount that the seller is offering is zero or less than the amount that the buyer is obligated to pay, and there's a gap, okay? And like I said, my advice is that you, uh, that you, you know, put the percentage of purchase price if that's applicable. Sometimes though, it makes more sense to calculate the dollar amount and put a dollar amount instead. Like if there's a gap of like $2,800 and putting a percentage doesn't work. So you sell is already offering to pay 2.5% and then there's a gap. So you could put 0.5% of the purchase price or something like that, or, or what have you, or you put the gross that they're going to pay a gross of 3% to get it up to the total amount. Anyway, I want you guys to look at this. This is okay because of the fact that the veterans administration does not allow the buyer to pay the buyer brokerage commission. Uh, this is okay to, uh, of course, we always have to discuss it with the buyer, but this is something that in that circumstance, you would feel a lot more free to go ahead and use this. Since the since under the VA loan program, buyer cannot pay buyer's brokerage commission, buyer hereby requests seller uh, and seller hereby agrees to pay buyer's broker a uh, blank percent of the purchase price, okay? And you would need to write the words of purchase price or blank dollars, flat fee, whatever makes the most sense. And think of this as the gross amount. So whatever the gross amount is. So if the seller's only offering this much, but your buyer brokerage agreement says this much, put the gross in because you're amending what they've offered. And so you want to put the gross amount in. Uh, as a total real estate commission due to buyer's broker at closing, nothing herein shall be interpreted as a request to alter, modify, or change the commission to be received by seller's broker, if any, that seller may have agreed to pay seller's broker in separate written agreement. That disclaimer, that last line is there because it's a violation of license law to put any language in a purchase and sale or an amendment to the purchase and sale that is signed by a buyer and seller that causes another broker to get uh, a reduction in the commission that they'll be paid. So, um, that's where we have to make that that clarity. Let's look at the generic multi-purpose special stip. This one can be used for any other type of loan where it's not a VA, but you've got to be careful because we've got to make sure that, you know, buyer has agreed to come out of pocket and there's no law, if it's not a VA, that's telling them that they can't pay the commission in the buyer brokerage agreement. So if a buyer um, is uh, wanting to put in an offer, it's just like any other term. 
Are they going to ask for closing costs? What kind of loan are they going to do? Uh, what kind of uh, purchase price are they putting in? Et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the key terms that's going to make or break the overall appeal of their offer. And before you just go ahead and put this in, you are supposed to discuss this with the buyer and see if the buyer wants this language put in, okay, in the event that a co-op fee is not being offered um, or that the co-op fee is less than the amount that the buyer has agreed to pay you in the buyer brokerage. In that event, if it's just like, hey, buyer, do you want to ask for closing costs? Hey, buyer, do you what kind of price do you want to ask for? All of this affects the buyer's, you know, um, um, ability to perhaps engage in a binding contract. It's all the sellers looking at all their, their total net and all of the uh, terms. You may have a situation where the buyer says, hey, I can afford to pay the difference in that uh, co-op commission. They're going to offer a 2% of the purchase price and I can afford the 1%. I want to get this house. So I don't want to ask the seller to pay a, a, a total 3%. I'll pay the difference that's in the buyer brokerage. Right. All I'm saying is this is a conversation we have to have. But the way this reads is very, very similar. It says buyer hereby requests and seller hereby agrees to pay buyer broker blank percent of the purchase price. You guys will have to write in the words of purchase price or um, you use one or the other. You don't need to put them both in there because then they'll contradict each other. or if it's more appropriate, a flat fee as a total real estate commission, that's the total. So don't just put the gap amount, put the grand total you want the seller to uh, come out of pocket with uh, as a total real estate commission due to uh, buyer's broker at closing. Nothing herein shall uh, be interpreted to request uh, as a request to alter, modify, change the commission to be received by seller's broker, if any, that seller may have agreed to pay seller's broker in any separate written agreement. So that's that disclaimer saying- hey, Audrey, is Rebecca available or Amanda? Well. I'm sorry? I heard a question. Office with Keller Williams Midtown. Hello? Sorry, y'all. That's okay. Okay, guys, that was my, I think that's my last slide, yep. Questions or comments about any of this? Are y'all told me I explained it so well that you don't have any questions or comments? <laughs> <laughs> that can't be true. Come on. Do you, what do you think of the uh, FHA and VA uh, paragraph 13? Like it, don't like it? Angie, it's Pam. Can you hear me? Um, I can barely hear you. All right. Let me see if I can hit my I volume. I can hear you a little better now. Okay, great. Um, the VA one, I'm my question about it, I'm looking at it thinking, why would they sign a buyer broker agreement saying they're going to pay 3% when they're doing VA and they can't pay anything outside of it? And if I was a, one thing when we're talking to our seller to say, you know, when we're making the point of, wanting to offer the most options for someone, that's a prime one because they can't pay it. So you're cutting out any buyer who is a VA, period. It, it, exactly. And my only thing, there are two things of, I, would, I would argue that the benefit of signing the buyer brokerage agreement with a VA buyer would be people, things change. And people may say, I desire to use my VA benefits and I desire to be a VA buyer but they, people can change loan types, number one. And number two, your buyer brokerage agreements establishing your ability to, um, um, your ability to um, represent them as a client. So that's establishing your client relationship. <clears throat> and number three, if you have the buyer brokerage agreement with your VA buyer, then the language here uh, it, it is uh, in paragraph, um, I mean, special step 619 is going to help support the fact that the buyer's obligated under that buyer brokerage. And there is, the, you know, the buyer broker is not working for free, but the buyer's prohibited from paying it. So I think those two really go together. And again, if you're, um, <clears throat> again, those are the types of conversations that as far as yes, alienating a um, a VA buyer um, 
any buyer though, if you think about it, yes, um, your VA buyer actually has some leg to stand on because they can really use this special step nine, two, 619. But the other buyers out there that'll have to come out of cash, um, come up with extra cash to close to pay their buyer brokerage commission, that could end up cutting out a lot of prospective buyers if they can't, in essence, finance it into the purchase price. Because at the end of the day, the buyer's really the one paying it. It's basically a question of whether it's going to be financed into the purchase price or not. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more comments, questions? Love it, hate it. Okay, guys. Well, this is being recorded. Oh, somebody had a hand up. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure. It says K Max. Not sure. Um, let me know your question, please. Yep. Yeah, my question is. It kind of sounds like we almost be will be using buyer brokerage agreements per offer. In other words, it, it's it seems like the the if you're representing a buyer that the way that you're structuring an offer will change based upon the scenario that the seller is agreed to. So, it, I mean, is that true? Or does one buyer brokerage agreement cover all of those offers? Well, see, there are two sep they're, they're really three separate agreements. You've got your listing agreement, your purchase and sale, and your buyer brokerage agreement. It, it, just like if I was going to go to a listing appointment and I'm going to say to the seller, this is the gross commission. This is what I'm working for. OK. Um, and then I'm going to uh, agree that if I sell this house, that's what I'm getting. And then there's the option of having a portion of that gross commission. So obviously it would need to be a higher amount if you're going to share a portion of that and the seller has to agree to it. You establish with your buyer. And that the amount doesn't need to change based on what the seller's offering. You establish with your buyer what you're willing to work for, period. And then depending on the circumstances of whether there's a co-op fee being offered, that's when you have the discussions with the buyer of, okay, buyer, since there, the amount, if any, that is being offered as a co-op commission will offset what you owe. So if it's at least the amount you owe, great. If it's exceeding it, great. You owe nothing out of your pocket. But if it's less than, you need to understand, and this is where that conversation is going to happen on your buyer brokerage conversation, that the gap, if there is a gap, could be the total amount or it could be a lesser amount than you know, we'll have some options if you want where we can ask the seller to cover that. They may, they may not. This is, uh, though, ultimately going to be your responsibility if the seller is not willing to pay it. So the um, you don't need to do redo your buyer brokerage agreement based on what they're offering. I hope that makes sense. So you, you've established what you're working for with that buyer. And then whatever the seller's paying is simply offsetting that. And you don't need to change your buyer brokerage agreement to match what the seller is paying. Okay. Um, it, it, I, I tell a story in my um, agency class, true story uh, of a arbitration, a very, you know, spirited, uh, ugly arbitration that I went to uh, some years ago. And um, it was with a very big brokerage. Um, and you would think that the broker that supported their agent would have understood this concept. Um, they should have. But their agent, um, uh, the buyer, was unrepresented, uh, found the marketing that our listing agent had done, uh, attended an open house, signed the registration for the open house, was asked repeatedly and put in the registration that they were not being represented. Uh, talked to the listing agent for approximately, and all this could be verified through emails, phone calls, etc. Uh, talked to the agent for almost two weeks, got pre-qualified with the agent's preferred lender. Uh, agent went back, took pictures of the attic, all these discussions about the house with this unrepresented buyer. Then the buyer suddenly is uh, tells the agent, I'm ready to make an offer now. And then out of nowhere, um, 
that evening, she gets an offer from a buyer agent that is now um, signed that day a buyer brokerage agreement with that buyer to represent them. So she had an exception written in her listing that said if something like that were to happen, that the buyer broker would only get 1% of the co-op. And that is what uh, we agreed to pay at um, closing. And they took us to arbitration. And no matter what I said, I could not get this through to the buyer agent. And he testified under oath that because his buyer hired him and pay, agreed in his buyer brokerage agreement to pay him 3%, that was what he was entitled to earn. I said, I'm not disagreeing with you, but the person who agreed to pay you the 3% was your buyer. Our seller did not sign that buyer brokerage agreement and never agreed to pay you 3%. Our listing never agreed to pay you 3%. And you did not procure a cause of sale. You, you basically are a parachuting agent and that buyer is entitled to representation. Money and agency are two different things and they can hire someone to represent them. And that someone can be on that contract and you're representing them and you establish that and you mark on the contract that you're representing the buyer as a client. All that's great. That has nothing to do with whether you procured cause of sale and actually earned that co-op. This agent actually wasn't really even entitled to any commission, but we allowed him to have the 1% because uh, of the fact that we had identified that that was what we would offer. So fine, we offered to pay the 1%. Not only did they lose the arbitration because they didn't understand, but they appealed it and lost a second time. But that's what I want you all to understand. And it amazes me, even agents that have been licensed 30 years are shocked when I say to them, when the buyer agrees to pay you a certain amount in your buyer brokerage, that amount is only the buyer agreeing to pay and they're the only one who has agreed to pay that amount. And that amount has no effect on what the seller has agreed to pay. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's something that we all need to be really, really, really aware of. And, um, and, and, you know, now more than ever. So, and we also want our buyers to be very well versed and very well educated about how we earn our money and also why it's important to just, um, to just be loyal, uh, loyal to our agents, um, and, and allow our agents to earn procuring cause of sale. So I'm running over. So I just got a, a note that I'm, uh, running about six minutes over. So I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Um, but, Email me at Angie at heartofatlantagroup.com if you have any further questions. Um, and of course, you can also reach me or Tom anytime at <clears throat> broker <laughs> at heartatl.com. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you all being here today. Thank you, Thank you Angie. Angie. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Angie.